So I want to introduce our panelists today, um, looking at the, the media and um, looking at the resilience of the Midwest. Joining me is Kristen McQuarrie. Uh, she's an editorial board member and columnist for the Chicago Tribune. And Vendelin Von Brito, who's Midwest correspondent for The Economist. Vendelin, I'll start with you. Why does The Economist have a Midwest correspondent? Um, we've had um, freelancers here for a long time, but um, uh, only for the last 10 years we actually had a, a staff member, a Midwest correspondent uh, based in Chicago. Well, it's, uh, to me it's obvious because the Midwest is terribly important, both politically and, uh, and economically. And, um, and we can see it right now in the current um, campaign for the presidential election. Um, you have to carry the Midwest. I mean, it, there are lots of swing states in the Midwest. There are lots of very, Ohio is a very important state and others. So um, the Midwest matters. So I, I look after 10 states and um, mostly located around here. Thank you. And Kristen, um, there's kind of a, a counterintuitiveness to the fact that we have a lot of businesses coming to Chicago to put their headquarters here. Um, and yet, just from this question, you know, we have this conversation about shootings in, in, in a hotel, certainly in the news. Um, the state and the city has not been um, receiving a lot of flattering coverage. You know, so why do you think that businesses still flock? Why does the city have such resiliency um, as it pertains to drawing talented people and important business? Well, am I on? Is it on? Can you hear me? OK. Um, the city does right here, where you look out the windows and you see beautiful downtown and Lincoln Park and even the South Loop is, has over the past 20 years really transformed. But um, I guess I would just take issue with the fact that you know we are still a, a tale of two cities. We saw that a lot with the last mayoral election. And the reason that Rahm Emanuel ended up in a runoff, because a lot of communities feel terribly neglected. Um, so the resiliency is certainly here downtown. Um, if you are a company looking to relocate, it's beautiful. You have culture, you have Shakespeare theater, you have um, world-class transportation, O'Hare. Um, you have an opportunity to get tax credits and tax incentives to come to the city. Uh, in that way, the city is very inviting to large businesses, but I would say there are pockets of the city that haven't seen new economic development in um, a decade. And so it is just a very different environment depending on where you where you are. And that raises an interesting question, and again, uh, dovetailing off of that last session and a discussion about being humane and humanity, you know, at what point does a business have a, a, an obligation to uh, tackle some of these issues that exist in Chicago and not just you know, look at the benefits it, it brings, but also look at how the reputation of the city itself may impact the corporate reputation. I see the corporate community here trying. I don't know how successful you can they are, and, and it's a tough metric to try to measure. But I mean, we have um, corporations come into the Tribune editorial board all the time talking about new after-school programs that they're trying to get involved in, or they're donating to some of the largest ph philanthropy organizations. We had the mayor recently, um, well, a couple of years ago, it's supposed to open this year, but he really courted the owner of Whole Foods and convinced him to open a store in Englewood, which is one of the most depressed communities in, in the city. So there are little pockets of hope, but I think, you know, by and large, businesses are hesitant to, to move into some of those neighborhoods. And I wish that they didn't adhere so closely to the demographics of what would make a good location, because I think those demographics are wrong. And I would like to see the corporate community take a little more risk. And Vendelin, you cover, you mentioned Midwest and the, and the political um, importance of the Midwest as well as the business importance. But I cannot avoid asking from the political side, from the perspective of your uh, international readers, how crazy do they think we are? <laughs> um, I don't think um, people really think you're crazy, but they are baffled. Um, <laughs> but they are baffled by what's going on. And I just spent um, a week in Europe and the First question everybody asks me is, you know, what's going on and who is Donald Trump and you know, and they sort of, they they find it 
highly entertaining, but also very scary. Um, so, um, and I think that there's a general um, hunger to understand what's going on, you know, to explain the phenomenon. You know, how come that the two insurgent Bern insurgents, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, are really doing quite well? Um, and, and, and today we have the New York primaries, and it'll again be a battle uh, between those two extremes somehow. Um, and so, so there's a lot of um, desire to, to, to really understand this phenomenon, and, and people have caught on to what's going on quite late. You know, they said, gosh, you know, this is new. This is sort of a new chapter in American politics. And do you think that will have a, an effect on businesses that are looking at the United States, looking to expand, looking to move into the US and, and more specifically to the Midwest? I think from what I hear, but of course nobody will go on the record saying that, that if people are thinking, if, if big European companies say are thinking about investing in America, not only in the Midwest, just generally at the moment, they will wait until November. They, you know, they want to know the, the, the regulatory environment, the whole, you know, I mean, if either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump becomes president, that, that has a huge impact for America's economic policy, if they do any of the things they are saying now they would do. And that frightens people. So if they can, they hold off, I think, at the moment, yeah. And Kristen, what, would you, what advice would you give uh, to them? We have a lot of corporate communicators here. You know, uh, advice to them and the communications for, on behalf of their organizations in Chicago and Illinois that might actually have um, a positive impact on the direction of, of the governments in, in Illinois. Ooh. Um. I mean, I, again, I think they've tried. I think there's a hesitancy to really insert themselves in what is, very, you know, a lot of political gridlock, both at the city level and the state level. I mean, we're operating now 10 months without a state budget. We have a Republican governor, a Democratic supermajority House and Senate. Uh, they can't even get to in the same room together. Um, we have the city of Chicago that is um, has really dangerously unfunded pension systems for a lot of its public workers, and yet no plan to dig themselves out. Pressure from corporate, from the corporate side, I mean, the businesses are looking for stability. They want to know what their tax structure is going to look like next year, and they don't know because of the political environment, um, among many, many other things. The teachers are about to go on strike. Um, all of these things have economic impacts for businesses, and perhaps if they were more um, critical and not afraid of retaliation, which I think many of them are, they might be able to nudge political leaders more than they are currently being nudged, which is really not being nudged at all. Um, Vendelin, from a European perspective, I mean, is it different? How do the businesses, um, you know, combine their reputation with the reputation perhaps of the, the city or the country that they operate? You mean how do they see the Chicago and the city? Or, or well, no, actually where they reside in Europe, is there a different perspective to that? From an obligation standpoint, do businesses in Europe um, see that synergy um, between their reputation and the reputation of, of their city and, and local community? Oh, yeah, I think, I would think American businesses have, are even more invested in their local community. Um, and and I think that's actually admirable. I think that's one of the great things about America, you know, that they come to a new city and they also ask not, not only, um, you know, where's best for me, you know, to, 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 to set up shop, but also what can I do? I think that's that's actually a great trait of, of this country. Um, in Europe, I think many companies have their headquarters. It's sort of obvious where they would have their headquarters. You know, for instance, in Germany, it would tend to be Frankfurt, or you know, they um, so 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 they they look a little bit where the others are, <laughs> or or you know, they obviously want to be close to their factories and production sites. That's another factor. Yeah. Um, Kristen, uh, we're you know looking at the heartlands. We talked a lot about Chicago and some about Illinois, but. Um, as you look around uh, different cities within the Midwest, um, you, do you see a city that perhaps is making its way out of you know, troubled times um, where you're not only having a vibrant business community, but the, the, the social community is, is more vibrant as well? Is there an analogous city that we can look to 
uh, to say that that's maybe the path forward. Well, I hate to be Debbie Downer, but um, Detroit did have similar financial pressures. I mean, I, I would hate for the city to get to a point where it had to file for bankruptcy in order to reorganize its debt, but it just looks more and more like there's just there's just no way out. You can't tax Chicagoans enough. They're being taxed so much that they're leaving. We just had a story in the Tribune recently that, you know, millionaires are the largest group leaving, and a lot of people might be like, well, fairly well, good luck to you. But that they are our economic engine as well. Those are people paying taxes. Um, we also had a story about middle-class black families um, fleeing the city. So you do at some point have to consider how big of an impact the, the finances are, are having on people. We're about to have the largest property tax increase in the city's history. Um, so some sort of dramatic restructuring of debt, I think, um, you know, like Detroit, might be a path forward for us. But we are not Detroit. I mean, we have a very diverse industry base, we have transportation, we have outstanding healthcare institutions, we have um, you know, g great performing colleges. Uh, we have a lot more to offer and to kind of dig ourselves out than Detroit did. Um, we have the White Sox. Yeah, all right, I'm with you on that I one. Know, I know you thought I was gonna <laughs> go the other way. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I do think something dramatic is gonna have to happen to shake us out of this. I mean, the city council still, we have 50 city council members who have kind of overseen the decline of the finances of the city for decades, and they're still at city council meetings talking about banning smokeless tobacco at ballparks. I mean, I think we have bigger issues that we should be focusing on. And how about you, as you look and you cover uh, 10 states, I think you said, yeah. you know, do you see um, cities where you really admire the growth and, and, and how the city has a great reputation and perhaps even has a halo effect to, to um, making a company that decides to headquarter there, you know, to give them a better reputation. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe add to, 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 to Detroit and Chicago because it's, it's sort of something we, we looked at too, you know, is, is Chicago the next uh, Detroit? And my sense is no, it's not. <laughs> um, there's a very different feel to this city. And I talked to the lawyer of the law firm that, that took care of the Detroit um, bankruptcy. And, and the emergency manager came from that law firm, and um, and they said, you know, we've we've gone through the scenario, and and we don't think it'll happen here. Having said this, it's it's dramatic. What's <laughs> what's going on? And and I think it it scares businesses, uh, you know, just because it seems to get worse and worse and worse. And there's no, I mean, over the, ever since I moved here, there's nothing has happened to really improve the situation. Um, and and that is something which I think ways on Chicago, um, and, and it's a shame because it would be, in so many other ways, it would be a perfect location for business. Um, geographically, in terms of, as Kirsten said, what, what the city offers, you know, that, that, that's all wonderful. Um, but again, in, in, you know, there's so much of the, the negative news, and every week now there's a list that uh, either Illinois or Chicago is on that is disparaging, you know, <laughs> most corrupt, um, you know, most dangerous, whatever it is. Um, and I'm curious, you know, from both of your perspectives, being in the media and, you know, your colleagues who are looking for stories, does that open an opportunity, though, for the positive stories that these businesses have to bring? Because there are a lot of very positive stories out there. Um, but unfortunately, you know, they get kind of covered over by the avalanche of, of the negative oftentimes tied to social political uh, issues. So, you know, do you see this as being an opportunity and maybe even a responsibility of corporate communications uh, to carry the water a bit on, on the positives? I think so. Um, the Tribune launched not too long ago Blue Sky, which is kind of a separate section in the newspaper where we try to highlight entrepreneurs, um, you know, when the mayor, he's about to expand 1871 because we have a great tech hub here. I think those stories are there. They're in the paper every day. They're not on the front page. They don't, they're definitely not in your broadcast news coverage. But I think there is a hunger for reporters to um, to uncover those those gems. And it's not that we're always looking for negative news. Those The positive stories are out there, but they just don't get as much attention. 
yeah, for us the same, you know, if I, if I, in, and there are these stories here, you know, 1871 is a great example, but if I pitch a story about a wonderful business and how well it's run, <laughs> you know, my editor will inevitably say, well, why, why, why should we care about this yeah. now? You know, so, so they, and that, that is a little, um, that's sometimes a bit frustrating, surely. Um, so, 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 no, we, we, we try, of course, also to, to highlight um, what's going on and, and the progress being made, but, over the last year, and, and unfortunately the government in Illinois has not really, the state government has not helped, you know, the news has been overwhelmingly quite depressing. And also actually, I come back to my <laughs> point about baffling, a little baffling. I mean, I, I didn't even know that you couldn't have a, a, a budget for, for nearly a year. You know, it, it seems inconceivable somehow, and, and yet it happens. I mean, Illinois is not the only state, but there's, I think, one or two others where it's the same. So that's, that, that, that is very surprising. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, it was brought up in the last panel, um, what we're also seeing, you know, looking at North Carolina with the House Bill 2. Uh, we saw in Indiana when they passed legislation around um, uh, same-sex marriage, uh, they lost tens of millions of dollars in, in revenue. Um, are you seeing more of this intersection of uh, social political issues and business news? Because it does seem like businesses are now stepping up and, and making comments and, and, and pos taking positions that in the past perhaps they, they, they wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, we experienced that in Chicago a couple of years ago. Chick-fil-A, the president, made a comment during an interview um, that he supported the biblical definition of marriage as between a man and a woman. That's all he said. Uh, it's not that Chick-fil-A doesn't hire gay people. It's not that Chick-fil-A doesn't serve gay people. But that was enough to start a firestorm here where a Chick-fil-A had been planned um, in the city. And the alderman came out and said that, no, he was not going to allow it to open. And you know what? You really can't do that either. This person has a First Amendment right to, as a corporate CEO to say what his beliefs are. There is a difference between him just saying what his beliefs are and how the restaurants run. Um, really, government, if your zoning is correct and you know, all of your ducks are in a row that way. It's it's hard on a on a moral ground in that sense to, to stop Chick-fil-A, and they did in fact end up opening. And then it was interesting that the other side, you know, if you don't want to go to Chick-fil-A and, and help their business, you have every right to not do that. But then you saw more conservative um, leaning folks come out and line up and want to support his right to be able to say that. So um, it, it is a new, it's a new day. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a person of if, if that, you know, corporate chiefs should be able to say what they think, the market can react, um, government has its own place in all of this, and it's just kind of a new world. We haven't had too many of those types of religious freedom issues in Illinois because we have a very strict state statute that you, you, you cannot discriminate in any way, but it's in our state law and other states that don't have that are running into some trouble. Well, we saw that in, in Indiana, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that was a huge thing. And I think Governor Pence totally underestimated what, what his <laughs> law, his religious freedom restoration law would do. I think he thought that would just, you know, breeze through and, and wouldn't be a problem. And in fact, it caused not only a huge outcry, but, but also it really hurt Indiana in that investments were canceled and it sort of, it, it's, it's a shadow over the reputation of the state. So that, and that shows you, you know, how, how companies actually really do play a role in society and how what they say and what they think, you know, carries weight and people listen to that. I think that's particularly true for big companies with very well-known names, you know, I mean, McDonald's here is a, is a good example. Whatever M McDonald's comes out with, you know, whether you like it or not, but it's it's big news. <laughs> um, but but even smaller or mid-sized, I mean, it's it's become increasingly important. I think that's good on many levels, but also sometimes, you know, CEOs or other senior figures in a company become so careful in what they say. You know, that's sort of the flip side, that it's sometimes also a little frustrating. So I think you have the two sides to the, to, to, to the trend. Do you think that trend will change uh, how reporters cover issues? I mean, will it be more likely to, to step beyond perhaps the political and, and start seeking out comment from businesses? I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that we, you know, purposefully stir the pot in that way and try to 
shape the news. Um, we're more likely to kind of let the news unfold. So I, I don't think I would see that happening. Um, with the rise of the Donald Trumps, I mean, that is kind of politically. There's more than one? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, brace yourselves. <laughs> new world of being able to be politically incorrect at every turn. Um, but but it, it, I think that's a reflection of the fact that we did get to a point where everyone was, you had to be so careful about what you said and everybody had to apologize all the time for, for misspeaking on the campaign trail. And, you know, that maybe that will happen in corporate America too, where, you know, you can speak your mind unapologetically so and just embrace, you know, whatever your ideology is. Do you think it'll change the, how these issues are reported upon? I think it already ha it has changed, and um, and I must say on on certain issues such as the religious freedom restoration law, I I did try to talk to businesses. You know, I wanted to hear their their view. You know, so 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 you do actively seek as a reporter. You, you want to hear their views, and that's that's relatively new. You know that that because that's a it's a political and societal issue which has very little to do with the company itself. Another example is, for instance, the um, union legislation in Wisconsin. You know, obviously, you know, you. I, I would then try and speak to I don't know Harley Davidson. You know, how, how do they have? Are their workers unionized? You know, what do they think? Now they would be very careful in what they say because they know. But but at least you know you try. <laughs> be just because I think it's it's important and and our readers are interested in in, in increasingly interested in their views. And I think for communicators, it, it makes the job a little bit tougher because now we have to stay on top of every issue out there because you might get a call but no, yeah. for a comment on that. Um, well, I do have two journalists here, and we have a lot of communicators in the room, so I want to be fair and let you ask some questions. So we've got a hand up already, so here we go. Hi, I'm Tom Key from VW Credit, but early in my career I was a reporter on a newspaper in Central Illinois, and one of the reasons I left that for the corporate world is because it was hard for me to just report on all the craziness going on without being able to really do things about it, and so I thought maybe I could get involved with it. But now when I look at it, and you look at our state, and you look at the, the government, and you see a lot of bureaucrats and showmen rather than statesmen, and I wonder, for me, when I've said, well, maybe I should run for an office, I say, but why would I put myself and my family through that? Because a lot of the, the media scrutiny and a lot of the social media things, there's a, you take a lot of flack. And so I think, I think that scares some people away. But I'm curious about you, if you've had discussions at our editorial board meetings at the bar later or wherever you happen to go to talk, have you thought about that at all? And, and what's your views of why we don't see more statesmen as opposed to bureaucrats and showmen? Well, the bar is in my office at the editorial board. Um, I mean, it, it is increasingly frustrating because we, we are the opinion side. So we don't report straight news. We do take positions. We do try to move um, public opinion. We do try to nudge public officials. And my boss has a joke that, you know, it only takes 10,000 editorials before you finally make a difference. So, you know, on finances, I'm on like, I don't know, 1,222. So I've still got a ways to go. <laughs> But it is, it, it is frustrating, and um, the climate has gotten increasingly aggressive. Some of the people who run for the state house, um, I actually interview almost all of them because we endorse in every single race, and they are good-hearted, salt-of-the-earth people who want to make a difference, probably like yourself, and then if they happen to be a threat to an incumbent, they get thrown mail pieces at them that are just um, really disturbing. I mean, the last time around, uh, the Democrats cast a couple of the candidates who are running as being, um, f you know, favoring sex abuse uh, folks, like, the f you know, siding with people who are sex abusers. And it was so six degrees of separation, you can't, I don't even want to get into it. But yes, that is the climate that we're in in the state. And I don't think it fosters an environment for statesmen. It kind of fosters an environment for these aggressive attack dogs who their only goal is to maintain power in the respective houses. And um, you know, if we had statesmen, we would actually have a lot of these issues solved. We don't. I, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a real problem. I think that we lose some of the best people who, who could run for office 
simply because they know exactly, you know, what what might happen or the kind of scrutiny they will be under and their family and, you know, in particular their children. And and let's just imagine they have a problem child or, you know, or something they know would be would, would potentially give fodder to to these stories. Then you may just say, well, it's, it's not for me. And that's a shame because I think we we, we I'm actually certain we lose a lot of talent and and you can see out of the how many do we have 19 70 either 19 or 17 Republican candidates you know you could see the types of people who <laughs> lined up uh, to become the nominee you know I don't think they were necessarily the strongest um, leaders this this big country could produce other questions go ahead Tom Wolf, Tom Wolf again from BP. Hi, Christian. Good Hi. to see you again. Um, you guys are not only uh, media, but you're also in a, in a business, and the business and the digital model has changed tremendously. Um, I think there's value in an article from uh, the Tribune or the Economist or an editorial from the Tribune versus a blog by Tom Wolf, which has almost no value at all. But other people might not think that, so there's a lot of competition. Your industries have tried to uh, change in that and change in that dynamic, the global street fight. Do you, as employees of the media companies, do you feel you guys are going in the right direction in a way that your newspaper and your magazine in a digital world can survive? I mean, I've only ever worked at newspapers, so I'm biased here, but I I do still see the value in traditional journalism every single day. I mean, I can't tell you the number of stories that come out of the Tribune newsroom, whether it was the red light camera scandal or all of the series on broken bonds, both at the city, um, corruption. I mean, we've had since 1973, I think 31 Chicago aldermen be convicted on corruption charges. That's about a third when you factor in how many have served since that time. So when you think about all the things that already occur when there's not a reporter in the room, can you imagine what would happen if there weren't? And so I, I'm very proud of the reporters at the Tribune, and I, you know, yes, we are struggling, we are downsizing. I left a smaller newspaper that when I started had about 60 reporters and was down to about 10 when I left. A lot of communities are going uncovered because of that, but I still kind of just stick to the model that, you know, you just, you can't replace traditional um, shoe leather reporting, um, and that's that's what we still offer, whether it's in the paper product or online. Um, I I agree with that. I mean, your on your first point, you're right. It's a shifting of tectonic plates. I mean, our industry has changed so much and is changing and adapting, and it's a huge challenge. And I think we at the Economist are going in the right direction with our website and our online offering. You know, I don't have the crystal ball. It, time will tell, obviously. For the time being, touch wood, we're still doing fine. You know, not as well as we used to do, but but we are basically doing fine. Um, as for the, you know, day-to-day -day grassroots reporting that um, Kristen mentioned, we do, of course, less of that because we are weekly. But but our great selling point is analysis. So so what we try to do is. To, to produce really interesting content for the globally curious. And, and, and my um, former editor used to say, our biggest competitor is time. <laughs> Not time the magazine, but time in that people just have so little time because there's social media and they're doing so many other things. And our goal is to still provide such interesting content <laughs> that we, we, we win the race against time against people's increasing busyness. So so that's that's what we are trying to do and being also very concise and very focused and very brief. You know, we um, every week I fight for lines. You know, we always try to get a little bit more space for our piece just because we get a very small, for, from my point of view, <laughs> always very little space. There's plenty of space in the Tribune. <laughs> come, come on over. <laughs> no more advertisers, lots of yeah. space. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, be interested though, because there is so much communications with social media, and it's just, we're inundated by communications and information. You know, uh, for both of you, we'll start with you, Ben. The process for determining what warrants inclusion. 
Yes, um, you, you're totally right. And our, our workload has increased a lot because of that. Because, of, for instance, we are all obliged to do social media, you know. I, I, was, I wasn't on Twitter until not long ago, but now I tweet a lot, you know. It's, um, but, but, but your point is, you know, how much, when, when is enough? Because, of course, if you do too many different and disparate things, then, then you don't really have enough time to report, to analyze. And so, so where to draw the line? It's it's tricky, and and I don't think there's a hard and fast rule, and it changes a lot too. You know what what? Um, but I mean, social media has become unbelievably important, and you just have to. And for instance, the older generation at the Economist, you know, who who are wonderful, wonderful colleagues who have a lot of experience, but they find that very tricky. You know, they 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 would like to go back to the Telegram, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, and Kristen from. Uh, the editorial board, you know, how do you, again, you're inundated with issues constantly. I mean, how do you, how do you go through a process to filter through what you want to, to editorialize about? Well, the page has a long history, long before I joined the board, of being very free market, fiscally conservative, and anti-corruption. So if you kind of fall into those categories, you tend to get more coverage. I mean, one of the, an editorial that we ran last week about a school district where the superintendent, you know, reporter had gone through all of his credit card statements and found that he was spending money on books and sweaters and teddy bears, and he had this $30,000 line of credit, and I mean, st that was the most clicked on opinion item of the day. So um, I think we do look for ways where we can, you know, y bring the hammer down on public officials. That's our, you know, the news side can't do that. So that's kind of our role. Um, but we also just look for entertaining stories, too. I mean, if you have, when, you know, John Kasich ate a piece of pizza with a fork, <laughs> you know, and that made huge news in New York, that's something that, you know, we like to delight readers too and kind of weigh in on just fun issues as well. And you have to eat Chicago pizza with a fork because it's the size of a casserole, right? Only, <laughs> only the deep dish. Okay, let's distinguish. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Anyone? Got a shy group. There's one. I had a comment. Um, I'm Susan Smansky from Spins. I worked in the media world for 26 years. I don't work now. I was going to comment. Tom's comment. So everybody that likes to read the Tribune, the New York Times, you need to subscribe and pay for your subscriptions online so that our editors are paid because these wonderful women don't do their jobs for free. So I encourage everybody, if you haven't, it's like $10 a month or $20 a month, depending on where you are. And The Economist, which has great articles too, you cannot read them unless you're a subscriber. Same with Harvard Business Review, which I applaud, because they're not bloggers. They are out working. So I just wanted to make that comment, because you're both very great. And I'm going to renew my Tribune subscription when I get home. Thank you. Your check's in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> wow, not bad, right? <laughs> Do we have subscriptions cards we can put on? No, <laughs> it is true, though. People get so frustrated at paywalls. And I understand that I get frustrated at them, too, when I'm trying to look at The Economist or something. But you know, we, we, we are a pretty lean organization. We don't hand out you know, multi, multi-million dollar raises to our lower level employees. I can't speak for the, the guys at the top, but no, it is true that if you want good journalism, you do have to fork over a little cash. Don't disagree. And I, I actually get the paper delivered at home and read it online, so I'm supporting you both ways. Yeah. Um, my final question would be basically where we started. Any advice you'd have for people who, who are responsible for communicating on behalf of their businesses, how they can help their company reputation while enhancing the reputation of the community that they operate in. I'll start with you. I mean, I sort of like the idea of kind of the rogue CEO who is opening a Whole Foods in Englewood. So, I mean, if you can convince your your corporate side to do really bold initiatives in some of these communities that are just desperate for economic development, I think that's a story that would get covered. It's not something that shareholders probably appreciate, but um, improving your community means, you know, actually walking the walk. And so um, I live on the south side. It's a, in, there are very lovely, stable, diverse communities on the south side that can't get 
um, a Chili's to come and open, you know? And I hear from aldermen who are on the phone with these retailers or restaurant executives or whatever, trying to sell themselves, um, but they, but corporate America is kind of stuck to that demographic of you, we will only open in these types of communities, and it just exacerbates the problem in Chicago. So I would, I would encourage more boldness from the corporate world. Um, I agree with that. For one important thing, if I can be so <laughs> presumptuous to give advice to CEOs, is that um, it's really important to communicate well and to be open and to explain, because if you don't, then journalists will try to, um, you know, infer what you might be thinking, and that could be very wrong. And so, if in doubt, you know, just just go and explain. And I think there's there's now a tendency not to do that, just because what we were talking about before, because anything they might say could then be misconstrued. But I think if in doubt, it's always better to be open to to, to try to explain. Most journalists, you know, are, are full of good intentions, so 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 they will they, they want to hear your story. And if you if you take the time and you talk to us, then 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 that helps us. But I think it'll ultimately also help the company. Great. Well, we'll end it there. Thank you very much, both of you.